Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and it is wonderful to have you all here and joining us today for this important moment. Uh, as our, our narrator said, I'm John Allen. I'm the president of Brookings, and it is my honor to introduce today's Democracy and Disorder Symposium, which celebrates the release of the new Brookings Report uh, under the same name. First, I understand we have a few special guests in the audience today, uh, Ambassador Kopi from Finland and Ambassador, Ambassador Simonovic from Croatia. You're most welcome this morning, and we're very glad that you're able to join us. Also, a very special welcome to Salam Fayyad. Sir, are you here? Sir, it is wonderful. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to see you before. Former Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority and a great advocate for the two-state peace process and a new distinguished fellow here at Brookings. We're honored by your presence, sir. <clears throat> as well, we have number, a number of members of the Foreign Policy Leadership Council. Uh, you're always welcome here. We're very grateful for your leadership and your support, and thank you for joining us today. In a few short moments, we'll welcome to the stage Senator Jean Shaheen from the great state of New Hampshire. And she'll offer a set of opening remarks, and then we will be followed by a moderated discussion between our Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy, Bruce Jones, and another honored guest and an old friend, John Tepperman, who is the current Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. Senator Shaheen and John, we are very grateful you could join us today, and we're deeply honored that you could help us with the launch of this project. But before we begin, a reminder that everything said by me and by the Senator is on the record, and I'd like to offer some preliminary remarks uh, on this unique moment in history. Uh, I was born the year the Korean War ended, and I grew up in a world defined, indeed dominated, by a thermonuclear bipolar world order. Even so, we were confident in our democracy and in our capitalist system, but we lived in a reality that it could be snuffed out in a blinding flash. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the close of the Cold War, Americans and our allies rightly believed in the triumph of democracy and the Western rules-based order. We had a sense of the inevitability of democracy, that the long arc of history would deliver us and much, if not most, of the rest of the world to systems of representative government in an overarching world order that prized truth, that preserved the rule of law, that respected human rights and promoted free trade and the economic intercourse of peoples around the world. Today, that inevitability of democracy is uncertain. Today, with the challenges to democracy in the United States and across Europe, with the rise of illiberalism, intolerance, and incivility in their ugliest forms, with the stresses on capitalism and free trade, with the emergence of authoritarian peer competitors, we may be faced with a reality that if we do nothing, democracy will have been the briefest moment of promise in the manner of human governance. The question before us in this period and on this day is what can we do to preserve our democratic way of life? How can we defend it? Or has the march of history and the emergence of illiberal counterweights and alternatives delivered us to the beginning of a long and painful retreat into authoritarianism. Our scholars in the Democracy and Disorder Report arrived at a very important question. What role will leading democracies and democracy itself play in changing the international order? And we're honored to have ambassadors from two important democracies with us today. The findings of their report are novel and important, and you'll hear more about them in detail soon. But for my part, I have my own answer to that question. And it begins with what role must the leading democracies play in today's geopolitical environment? I've spent my life defending democracy and preserving our shared democratic way of life against all enemies, foreign and domestic where others around the world may be willing to acknowledge the passing of democracy or embrace an alternative model. I refuse to believe that this is our choice. 
And with every fiber of my being, I believe that the United States and its allies around the world, by example and by practice, must be the force for the preservation of this form of government and of this precious system of governance. For us, there are no other options. There can be no other options acceptable to this nation, acceptable to our friends, acceptable to our people. America and American leaders must stand for our cherished values, stand openly and firmly against those leaders and those governments that would reverse our shared progress and stand just as openly with those who would defend it with us. Now is the time, and today is that moment. As the 2020 presidential election campaign season begins to gain momentum, the state of the American democracy and the future of the liberal world order must be at the heart of that conversation. Creating platforms for that important debate is, in fact, what Brookings is all about. And it was against this backdrop that Brookings sought to study the stress on democracy in 2019. What our scholars found in that is that competition between great powers today is nothing, nothing less than about the future democratic character of our international system. And that at this crucial juncture in history, democratic states are under increasing strain from interconnected sets of challenges that are political, economic, military, and increasingly technological. I very much endorse the findings of this study, and I commend the scholars who were involved. And in the absence of traditional leadership, we find that regions of the world are now in contestation that have emerged because we have seen harsh employment of policy, economic, a negative economic leverage, and intimidation from military tools, and in, and in truth, in an environment increasingly dominated in the cyber domain, exploitation in the cyber means. Advances in artificial intelligence will, in particular, only make these challenges more acute and formidable in the years ahead. And this includes the challenge of our digital authoritarianism, as we call it, which will undoubtedly utilize these related technologies to their own malign ends. Now, despite these downward trends, there are also signs of resilience, and I'd be remiss not to highlight them. At a time when global democracy is challenged, the majority of those living under democratic governance today importantly live outside the West. As large democracies such as India, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, Nigeria have grown economically stronger, for instance, they have proven more resilient to external authoritarianism and influence despite continued challenges to their domestic democratic institutions at home. Their relative health and the health of democracy in East Asia, the potential for further democratic advancements in Southeast Asia, and India's, very importantly, India's nascent indication that it may play a more order-shaping role in this world provides grounds for legitimate optimism and some hope in a world that is beset on many sides by authoritarian influence. This reality makes clear that protecting the democratic character of the international order will require new coalitions of democratic states beyond the transatlantic community with which we're so familiar. It's no longer just about the West, and ladies and gentlemen, in truth, it never was just about the West. The universal values that we have pointed to as being Western values indeed are embraced by hundreds of millions around the world. And our strength as a community of nations must be based in the future on our shared values if we are to preserve our democracies. If in the coming days and weeks and years, leading and emerging democratic states can renew or sustain their political institutions and forge a wide coalition for action, then we may see a period defined by a renewal and a reinvigoration of our democratic values within the international system. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's democracies fueled by these cherished values that have so powerfully 
tied us together these many decades still have great intrinsic strength to shape and advance a values-based order that protects democratic freedoms. For my own part, that's something I believe is fundamentally American as well, and is at the root of American values and the global American leadership that is yearned for now by so many in this world. So it's my sincere hope that the coming years continue to be defined by that American leadership and the values-based leadership both here and abroad, and for the good of us all. With that, I'll close, and please join me in welcoming a great champion of American democracy and a great American leader, Senator Gene Shaheen of the great state of New Hampshire. Senator Shaheen. Well, thank you very much, General Allen. I know John Allen is General Allen because I'm on the Armed Services Committee, and so the last time I saw him, he was before the committee. Maybe not one of your favorite memories. You were great, man. You were great. <laughs> um, but thank you for those thoughtful remarks and for convening this important discussion today. I'm really honored to be here with all of you, and you should go ahead and eat. You know, I always worry when I'm standing between the audience and food that, you know, I'm likely to be thrown out very quickly. Um, but I am honored to be here today for this important discussion. Um, we need to have this conversation now more than at any time I can remember. I was recently at the Munich Security Conference. I'm sure that there are others in this room who were there as well. And I was so pleased that we had 55 members of Congress, the largest congressional delegation ever to represent the United States in Munich. And I think we were there to send a strong message to our allies. And we did that in a bipartisan, bicameral, and I think very meaningful way. I think our presence and our message of unity and commitment to NATO, to the Transatlantic Alliance, and to democracy was very well received. Unfortunately, it was overshadowed by Vice President Pence's rebuke of our allies. And you may have, for those of you who weren't there, you may have seen some of the reports that said that the silence in response to his speech was truly deafening. And I think for good reason. Somebody commented to me that it would have been a great speech to give to the Ind Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce but it didn't seem to recognize who the people in the room were. In stark contrast to the Vice President's speech was the vision that was laid out by Chancellor Angela Merkel, her call to action and her appeal for us, for all of us, to hold on to our democratic values, to our institutions, to our agreements, and the commitments that we have made to each other and that have kept us safe for decades. I had an interesting conversation with uh, a German businessman who was there in Munich, and he had a chance to hear Vice President Pence, Chancellor Merkel, the Chinese foreign minister, and the Russian foreign minister, Lavrov. And his observation to me was that if somebody were sitting in the audience listening to those four speakers and they knew nothing about the world politics and the relationships that we, they would have come away thinking that the adversaries in the room were Germany and the United States and that the internationalists were Russia and China because that's the way the rhetoric was. Not, I think, a happy statement as we think about the challenges that we face. But Chancellor Merkel's statement was a clear indication that the liberal world order is not dead but that we can no longer stand on the sidelines and dismiss democratic backsliding. We must act, and we must act now, and I think that's the message of the reports that are being released today. There is clear evidence to back up her assertions, as we'll see in the discussion around the reports. Most democracy indices point to a rise in authoritarianism and a decline in democracy across the globe in the last decade. This democratic recession has been aided by the speed and ease of new technologies and methods to spread disinformation and suppress dissent. According to the Pew Research Center, 
93% of Americans receive their news online, with over 50% using social media for this purpose. The increased use of social media and the evolution of technology means that we have a very narrow window before the threat grows. And I think this gets to the heart of the democracy issues that we're facing, because the main target of these non-democratic states is none other than the topic of this symposium, and that is democracy and the liberal world order. Like many of you, I believe that democracy and the world order is worth fighting for. That's why we're here. The post-World War II order gave rise to the richest and most robust democracies the world has ever seen. And it's helped provide stability and security for much of the last 70 years. It produced the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, our multilateral development organizations, and integrated Europe and the Transatlantic Alliance. So it should come as no surprise, I think, that these institutions are now the targets of dictators, nationalists, and populists whose previous influence led to two world wars and the creation of these institutions to begin with. What I think is surprising, however, is that these non-democratic influences are suddenly having such a substantial impact. So I assume the reports are going to look at the, cre the conditions that have created this moment that we're in today. For much of the last 70 years, the chief architect of the liberal world order, or at least one of them, was the United States. But we are in no way immune to the ill effects of the global democratic recession. Fortunately, I believe the United States is well positioned to defend the liberal world order, albeit through more non-traditional means than we may have seen sometimes in the past. But we have no time to waste in doing that. I currently serve on the Senate Foreign Relations, Appropriations, and Armed Services Committees. So I get a chance to interact with my colleagues who con are concerned about foreign policy on a regular basis. During my time in the Senate, we've seen the Kremlin use hybrid tactics to attack democratic elections worldwide, including here in the United States. We've watched the military and economic expansion of China across Asia, Europe, Africa and Latin America, and we have most recently seen the results of unchecked monarchies and dictatorships as they attempt to silence dissidents and journalists in the Middle East and beyond. Despite the clear threats these actions pose to our democratic traditions and norms, the President of the United States has been reluctant to criticize leaders like Vladimir Putin and Mohammed bin Salman, and in fact, the Trump administration, unlike the administrations of George Bush, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama did not include a specific reference to maintaining democracy in its national security strategy. Instead, it proposed to cut U.S. foreign assistance to democracy programs worldwide by 40 percent. Of course, that's funding that Congress has restored. At home, we're seeing the same illiberal tactics and rhetoric of Erdogan, Victor Orban and Nicolas Maduro when President Trump criticizes the free press or his opponents. This is unacceptable in a democracy. As a nation, I believe we're better than this. But as I've said to our European colleagues, President Trump is a reality of our political discourse today. And we mustn't continue to spend all of our time and energy trying to dissuade the president from making some of these statements that we disagree with. Instead, we need to focus on bringing people together and showing up, shoring up support for illib the liberal world order through our clear actions. And on foreign policy, I believe we're seeing that from the legislative branch. President Trump began his first year in office with a Republican House and Senate, and Congress almost immediately passed legislation to curtail his authority to undo existing sanctions against Russia. And in fact, we imposed additional measures against the Kremlin for its interference in the 2016 elections. Upon hearing the President's views on NATO, Congress took clear action. We voted in support of the United States' enduring commitment to Article 5 and NATO. 
more times in 2017 and 18 than at any other time since the fall of the Soviet Union, despite the President's views on NATO. In the Senate, I've worked with Senator Tom Tillis to resurrect the Senate NATO Observer Group, which previously had been dormant for about 20 years. We're now gearing up on a bipartisan basis to shepherd another NATO enlargement round through the Senate and to celebrate the 70th anniversary of NATO in April and to show our bipartisan support in the Senate for NATO. Perhaps most important, we know that the actions that Congress have taken reflect the views of U.S. voters who overwhelmingly support global alliances and international cooperation. The Chicago Council on Global Affairs has shown that even millennials, the generation born between 1981 and 96, how many millennials are in the room? A number of you. Um, the largest voting bloc in the United States, the millennials value alliances and 72% believe the United States should support maintain its strong support for NATO. Boosted by these numbers, I believe Congress will continue to allocate significant levels of funding to help Europe deter threats, and furthermore, to strengthen democratic institutions from within. In the last year alone, we provided $6.5 billion toward the European Deterrence Initiative to support NATO and protect our Eastern European allies, and over $2 billion toward democracy programs worldwide. But, of course, there's definitely much more to do, and we need a strong, functioning executive branch to move forward. As Congress debated the funding for the newly established Global Engagement Center with the administration, we've seen Russia and China and other authoritarian states worldwide prop up new digital armies, including Russia's Internet Research Agency. They've invested in new technologies and continued to launch full-scale operations against democracies. They're continuing to do that, even at a moment's notice. For me, the event that really epitomized the threat that is posed by um, a number of these countries, particularly China, which I think we have failed to recognize for a long time in many ways, was early in January when China landed on the dark side of the moon. Remember that? The United States hasn't done that. We don't have any project to do that. And while China was landing on the dark side of the moon, you know where our NASA researchers were? They were furloughed because we were in a government shutdown. We are not going to be able to maintain our competitiveness and compete with democracies against China and Russia and our other threats if we don't take this seriously. The very fact that we continue to be a prime target for illiberal actors proves that we continue to be a robust democracy. But we will not remain resilient forever. We can't afford to lose more time and debate the need to be more forceful in our approach to non-democratic actors. It is more important than ever that we reinforce our institutions and respond to each attack with the full force of our democracy. We need to act now to create innovative solutions, to increase media literacy, and to renew our commitment to promoting and defending our values and the liberal democracy that protects them. I think that's what this symposium is all about. Where we are today reminds me of something that President Kennedy said in his 1960 inaugural address. He was talking about the Cold War context, but I think it has relevance for today. He said, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its maximum hour of danger. Well, make no mistake, this is our hour of maximum danger, and we are each called to defend democracy. Our challenge is to fully understand the factors driving the narrative against democracy and to take necessary measures to ensure that no adversary can manipulate our open internet and free press to turn our people against each other. So I thank all of you who are playing a role in raising these issues. I thank Brookings again for your work and for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Thank you all.
and now, like any good politician, I'm going to throw that out and leave. Thank you again, Senator. Can you hear me? Got to press the button. Now you can hear me. Hi. I'm Jonathan Tepperman. I'm here with Bruce Jones. Um, you'll see that we are uh, up here in matching suits um, with matching beards and matching Canadian accents. Um, all of that was worked out in advance. You know, I find it's the little details that separate a good conversation from a bad one. Um, so I, I hope you will, uh, will agree. Um, we're here to talk about the, um, the, the overarching um, uh, report that Bruce has written that um, summarizes the work um, of uh, uh, all the individual reports um, and, and provides some key takeaways. Um, Bruce, let me start with this. You and your collaborators have produced a, an extremely impressive body of work here. Um, if I were to, to, to uh, make one complaint, however, it would be um, with your lack of ambition. I mean, all you dealt with was fixing democracy and shoring up the liberal international order. Why stop there? Why not bring in climate change and a cure for cancer as well? Because uh, uh, that's the next project. So. Good, good. You have to leave something. Um, but on a more serious note, why link the two, um, the, the fate of democracy and the fate of the international order? Thank you very much, and thank you for being here, and my thanks to Senator Shaheen for opening the, the session and to General John Allen for, for presiding over it, um, and to all of you for being here today. The whole point is to generate the conversation with the people in this room, many of whom have done huge amounts of work over decades on these, on these questions. Um, I didn't know where we were going when we started this project. Uh, it was clear that there was a major question in London and in Washington, and then eventually in other capitals around the world, about what role some of the countries that had been the, the kind of essential pillars of international order over the past uh, three decades and, and beyond, uh, an essential question about what role they wanted to play in the world. I didn't know where it was going to take us, but I posed that question to the kind of assembled group of, of, uh, of scholars in foreign policy and asked them to look at this question of, what was going on within the countries that they knew best, from Japan to Taiwan to France to, to India to Israel, etc., uh, in uh, the debates around democracy and what implications it was going to have around international order. And as we worked the project and as we read the drafts and as we saw the debates, it became clear to me that what was going on is that we were having two conversations simultaneously uh, in Washington and in the international orders, in the international system as a whole. We've been having this conversation about why is it that we're encountering this moment of democratic retrenchment or democratic malaise or whatever what, how we were going to call it. And at the same time, we're having a conversation about what is the coming shape of international order, what role will China play, how assertive is it playing that role, etc. But in fact, these two conversations start to fuse. Um, that the deeper China has gotten in pushing itself out into the global south through infrastructure investments, through technology, through energy investments, etc., the more there is a, uh, an implication for the trajectory of democracy uh, that goes along with that, the more uh, they, and in particular the Russians, have sort of in engaged themselves, interfered, whatever terminology you want to use, in political systems in the West. These connections, these conversations connect. So it became clear to me that what was going on in this research was a, a dialogue between these two debates about the state of democracy on the one hand and the state of the order on the other. Now, I, I realize it's very bad form to um, start by questioning the underlying premise on which all of this works, anyway, but I'm, I can't resist. So um, let me ask the following question. The report starts by uh, painting a very gloomy picture about the state of the world uh, today. Um, and, and yes, there is a lot of evidence to point to both the existence of a democratic recession and a weakening of the post World War II liberal rules-based global order. Um, but is it possible that things aren't quite so bad? And um, what I mean here is the following. You know, one could, um, and in fact many have, 
um, uh, painted a a counter narrative, which is 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 equally plausible um, about how things are going today. And um, this is something that you allude to in the report report itself. To make this case, you would start with the fact that globally, most people's lives have actually improved dramatically in recent decades. And what that, there are lots of reasons for that, including the decline in interstate war, the decline in absolute poverty, the explosive growth of the middle class around the world, um, radical improvements in global health that have led to all kinds of better outcomes, um, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, um, the authoritarians, um, while they may be surging, are still vastly outgunned um, by the uh, democracies, which for all their problems remain far, far more powerful in all sorts of material terms. Right. Um, plus, the authoritarians, the leading authoritarian states like Russia and China, um, share very few interests, actually, um, apart from a desire to thwart the, the West. And while they have a partnership of convenience, it's very much of convenience. Um, Plus, there's reason to believe that the populist moment may have already peaked. So given all of that, I wonder if there isn't actually some danger in overstating the gravity of the problems that we supposedly now face, especially when it seems to me that one of the key um, problems uh, that the West is suffering from today is actually a crisis of confidence. Yeah, so it's a very good question because it seems to me at a moment in time where it's extremely important that we accurately calibrate the degree of challenge that we confront and not overstate it. We don't want to be in a threat inflation mode, uh, but also not understated. And I thought the senator's dark side of the moon illustration was a particularly apt one of the, I think, slightly greater risks that we underestimate the challenge than that we overstate it. Um, look, I think there's a tension that runs throughout the report. All those indices of performance over the last 20 years are sort of start the report, right? I mean, wars decline and global growth grew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were a number of positive things. And I think one of the sort of strange things in the debate in Washington right now is you can listen to the debate in Washington and it will sound as if the last 30 years have been this kind of hellscape of negative performance, which is just not the case by any empirical measure, uh, perhaps outside of the Middle East. Uh, so there are a number of, yeah, I'm laughing, <laughs> Salam is laughing. Uh, there are a number of very positive things that have happened. Uh, and we highlight that. It's also true, I think this project started, Michael Handel and I wrote a piece, sorry we did it for the Wall Street Journal, not for you, but we wrote a piece saying, look, before everybody freaks out, let's notice that if you measure by population as opposed to country, actually global democracy grew a little bit in the last period of time and as it is very high levels around the world. At the same time, I think one of the observations here is that, you know, put it this way, if India and Indonesia and South Korea were fully committed to propping up the international order and supporting democracy globally, et cetera, I'd feel more relaxed than I do. But those countries have not historically played the kinds of roles that Britain has played, that the United States has played, that France has played, that Germany has played, et cetera. And in those countries that have been the most important architects of the international order for all the ills and all the mistakes, the most important architects of international order, the malaise is quite serious uh, and the retrenchment is quite serious. Um, and I think the way, one of the images, I don't think we use this image in the report, but it always comes to my mind. I did physics when I was younger. If you think about radio waves, you get a radio wave that looks like this, that's fine. You get a second that comes behind it that looks like this, that's also fine. If they hit it at the exact same time, they do this. They amplify each other uh, dramatically. And I think that's what we're grappling with. If the democracies were in a moment of confidence and internal calm and, and sort of normal, normalcy, and we were grappling with China, okay. If we were grappling with the internal challenges and China were still sitting back in its corner, okay. But dealing with the two of them simultaneously is what worries me, that we are not going to rise to the not necessarily massive challenge, but we're not going to rise to it because we're preoccupied by our own internal Michigas uh, and that we'll sort of lose ground. And I think we are losing ground uh, pretty rapidly right now. So the, reform, the report has four main lines of argument or takeaways, each of which has a, arguably a controversial element to it. Um, in, in one of the first, you argue that the West should drop the notion of democracy promotion in fair, favor of what you call a shared agenda of democratic renewal. Um, two questions about that. First of all, when gridlock has utterly paralyzed the U.S. political system and other countries like the U.K. are now led by metaphorical midgets, um, what gives you hope that such a renewal is even possible? Uh, unicorns and wishful thinking. 
Um, uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, I think we end the report by saying it goes without saying that everything we're saying above doesn't hold unless the United States renews itself in democratic terms. There are another 30 scholars in a different program working on that at Brookings, sort of how do we renew ourselves as a democracy. Um, so what we're trying to do is sort of let's us since let's assume that the United States gets its house in some degree of order and think about the re-engagement of the world. Now, those two things, in truth, will go more hand in hand. Um, but it, it, let me go to the, the broader point. Um, you know, I spent most of my career outside of Washington. And so I have a slightly different reaction to some of the terminology that is common here. I think you, you probably share some of this. You know, five years ago, before I moved to Washington, if you had told me that the United States believed in a rules-based order, I would have looked at you a little funny. Uh, Rules-based wasn't a word that really comes to mind when you encounter American diplomats and American power in other parts of the world, right? Uh, that's just not the way the world feels when you look outside. And I always reacted to this notion of democracy promotion a little bit through a similar sense of kind of uh, the West uh, in a slightly arrogant way projecting itself out into a world that in many cases didn't have much choice to respond, in some cases wanted to respond, but there was something, there was a tension there. So I have a slightly different orientation to this point to begin with. But at this moment in time, when we have the kind of gridlock that we talked to, when we have the challenges in our own country that we're talking about, when the West has, across the West, has deep challenges of its own democracy, for the West to be talking about democracy promotion strikes me as ill-founded and unlikely to succeed. Rather, it seems to me, we should be paying a lot of attention to the dynamism of democracy outside of the West, we should be accepting that there are challenges of democracy inside the West, and we should be looking collectively at how do we renew democracy across that whole space. And so it's not that we wouldn't be spending a lot of time promoting democracy. It's that the kind of framing of that is a little bit less about the West taking itself out into the world and much more about accepting that we are part of a broader uh, process of attempting to consolidate democracy and renew democracy uh, under pressure, as are other parts of the world. I, I follow you on the domestic part, but on the international part, um, how it was what you're proposing actually different from what is done today in the sense that it sounds like you're still calling for giving all kinds of assistance to new and fragile yeah. democracies and helping them entrench. Yeah. Uh, we do that today, right? So how would it be different under your plan? Yeah, there's a, I think there's a kind of framework question. It's not a, an action question as to how do you conceptualize this? How do you, how do you talk about it? What's the rhetoric of it? Uh, I'm trying to get away from a rhetoric of the West exporting itself into the global South in particular and accepting much more that we are part of a broader uh, sort of community of democracies, if you want to use that term, all of whom have challenges and who can learn from one another. There are things that we can learn from India. There are things that we can learn from Indonesia. There are things we can learn from all over the place. So rather than a rhetoric of us exporting outwards, it's much more of a shared rhetoric. I think, I think that's going to be more successful internationally than a rhetoric of democracy promotion. Many of the tools would be similar, but the framing of it, I think, is quite different. And, and does that also imply greater acceptance of different models of democracy that may not look like the, the uh, American one? It, it certainly can. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time in this report, but I would draw your attention to one of the papers in the project by Dhruva Jaishankar, writing about India, in which he talks about the, the evolution of non-Western democracies and a number of the models that he thinks are important. One of his arguments is that the West does have to think about different models uh, of democracy. Uh, we didn't go quite that far in the overarching report, but that's certainly one of the themes that comes out in the papers. What I think is the most provocative of the proposals is your call to, um, in your words, detoxify identity politics and migration debates. What exactly do you have in mind? Yeah, good luck with that, right? Um, this is, again, sort of drawing from the inputs of the papers. One of the things I was most struck by, uh, and I should say, I should preface this by saying, as co-authors of the overarching report, Tori Tausig and myself, we try to strike a balance between, on the one hand, respecting the diversity of opinion in the reports. That's part of the model here. Independent scholars think whatever they want and say whatever they want. At the same time, trying to draw some common themes. It was pretty striking to me reading the inputs on migration and on the uh, way the migration debate has been used in European politics in particular, that scholars like Jamie Kerchick and Bill Galston and Shadi Hamid, coming from completely different perspectives, all reached the same conclusion. 
Uh, and the conclusion was that whatever they as a scholar or I as a scholar might believe about the appropriate levels of migration in this country, that it is legitimate in a democratic system to have an open debate about levels of migration, that that is not an illegitimate debate to have. Uh, it's, I think in this country in particular, because of the way this has been handled, um, both in terms of the kind of particularly nasty rhetoric around Muslim migration and et cetera, it's been cast in a very particular terms. We're trying to kind of step a little bit back from that and say, look, it is actually legitimate for a country to have an open discussion about what levels of migration it wants at any point in time, and then drawing distance between that on the one hand and what we term as pretty noxious uh, rhetoric around Muslim questions uh, in particular in Europe and, and in this country. And then twinning that with other um, research that we've done here, not just for this project but more broadly, uh, we think that some of the most successful work that's been done on integration of migrants and of refugees, by the way, has been in the way cities have taken the lead in a number of places, Germany in particular, in driving integration policy at a very local level. So you have these very toxic national debates that don't necessarily capture the dynamism of what's happening at a local level. And so the argument is to try to kind of accept a degree of open debate at the national level, but really focus in sort of implementation at the local level uh, where integration has actually been pretty successful in a number of cases. So it's trying to strike that that balance. But in terms of the the detoxification element, creating a safe space for these debates, this strikes me as one of these projects that a lot of people are working on right now, but nobody has yet quite come up with the answer yet. Um, but to make sure I understand you, is your contention that simply um, bringing these conversations into the mainstream um, will bring down the temperature and the, the nasty rhetoric on both sides? I think if twinned with this focus on what is happening at a local level, that's the aspiration. What we, when we've looked at this, and I say, and we've looked at the cities in Germany and cities in Sweden, some of the places where the national debate has been most toxic, when you go to the city level, actually things are working much better than that. So sort of trying to elevate the local response. And we have other work in this, in this program trying to do that, to elevate the local response uh, as a critical part of how we handle the migration question can try at least to to detoxify the you know, issues. This, this question of the disjunction between or disconnect between what's happening at the local level and the national level is a very interesting one. And James Fallows in his reporting has found that when you go out across the country and talk to Americans about the impact that migration is having on their community, typically they'll say, well, things are actually working pretty well in our town. It's the next town over that's having big, big problems. And then you go to the next town over and they say, well, actually, we're doing okay here, but it's the next town over that that that's really in trouble. Um, so, so I mean, how how do you how do you bring that together, and how do you end that disconnect and and um, create a, a something approaching a natural national consensus? A about what's actually happening, and B about how to deal with it. The experience we've had on this is that if you when, you, when you go into cities like Hamburg, who've done this extremely well, and you find the actual solutions that people have driven to local integration on the labor force, on the housing, on schooling, et cetera, and you start telling those stories and sharing those stories, mayor to mayor, governor to governor, some of that dissipates. Because one city over, they can see, well, okay, it actually worked okay in Hamburg, and that sort of lowers the tension around the issue. How that translates up into the national level, that's a kind of broader conversation, but at least as a starting point, focusing on successful integration at the urban level seems to us to be a, an important component of this. And you're not worried that by making a safe space for conversations about immigration, you won't be uh, uh, giving more power and a, a bigger microphone to the, the extreme nationalists and xenophobes who can now say what they're saying, not at the margins, but in the center. I am worried about it, um, and uh, we wrote that section of the report with some trepidation. Um, but it's not as if they don't have a big microphone right now. It's not as if they don't have a big microphone right now. It's not as if they're not winning this debate right now. You, um, you also call for strengthening cooperation with non-Western democracies, uh, above all India, as you've already alluded to. Um, now, that's not exactly a new idea. Um, people of and American policymakers and scholars have been uh, arguing to, that we should do just that for um, for more than a decade now, um, but it never quite works. Um, what gives you confidence that uh, that now is different, that it can happen this time? Yeah, and so again, I want to kind of draw you to the paper in the report by Dhruva Jaishankar, um, and it's emblematic of something that I see changing in India. Okay, over the I go to India several times a year on a good year. And I begin to see a change in the texture of the debate. You start to hear in India phrases like values-based multilateralism, 
What does that mean? Values-based multilateralism is Indian code for actually we're kind of on the democracy side, not the authoritarian side. They're not going to say it out loud because they're very worried about their relation with China, but it's the beginnings of a discussion in India about a need to shift carefully, uh, cautiously, their overall orientation towards the democracies. And in Dhruva's paper, you'll see an argument about why that's emerging in, Indian, in the Indian discourse and in the Indian debate, and, and where it is you can begin to see a movement towards, for example, greater cooperation with India on support to democracies in the global south, uh, infrastructure, sort of soft, you know, we're not talking about joint invasions here, right? We're talking about sort of a soft start. But it seems to me very important to capture that sentiment in India uh, and build on it in sensitive ways. Because you're right, it's not as if we haven't wanted that for a long time. We haven't had that, that hasn't been the appetite in Delhi. I see that starting to change. Dhruva's paper captures that. And that strikes me as a very important development in international politics. Do you see it elsewhere in key countries like Indonesia, for example? Well, look, I think we need to give India a dec- Indonesia another decade or so, right? Um, uh, and, and this is one of the challenges. I think we write about this in the report that, you know, if, if, a, if a number of the emerging democracies were a decade further on in their development or if we were more stable in the West, I think you could expect to see them carrying greater weight in this. But right now, that's going to be hard. So we have to be patient in terms of what we can expect. Uh, I think some of this has been mishandled in the last decade or so. But it seems to me there's a very important direction of travel in India and in East Asia more broadly, and we have to be very attentive to that. That's a, I mean, we may come to it, but it's a theme that comes out very strongly for me in the work is we tend to be very focused on developments in the transatlantic space. We're paying a little less attention to developments in the East Asian space, but they're quite significant in terms of the overall mix uh, of democracy and authoritarian power in the international system. So... Uh, um, you know, one of the, one of the, the key goals of this of this strategy that you're um, gesturing towards, or move, the reports move us towards, um, is <clears throat> um, a, a way of pushing back against the surging authoritarian states. Um, but given how different um, those countries are from one another, as we as we've already identified, um, does it make sense to talk about a grand strategy for opposing authoritarians in general, as opposed to a China strategy, a Russia strategy, a Hungary strategy, a Philippine strategy, etc.? Yeah, uh, I could go both ways on this. To be honest with you, I um, look. Put it this way: you're going to have to have a Russia strategy, which is distinct from your China strategy. There's no question. But it does seem to me that over the past five years we have watched something important change in the character of the China-Russia relationship. You said earlier, and it's accurate, these are two countries that do not share interests, they distrust one another, Uh, eventually they'll be at loggerheads with one another in Central Asia and other places. Right now, it seems to me pretty clear that both of them recognize that the West is at a moment of weakness and that they have an overweening interest in furthering the weakness of the West and are willing to put aside some of their differences temporarily to join, not join forces, it's overstated, but to to see each other both doing things that weaken us in quite important ways. I think from Beijing's perspective, they see Russia out there doing things that they wouldn't want to have to do, but they are perfectly content to see the Russians doing it to us in various places. Uh, And it creates some spaces for them that they would not want to have to get their hands dirty, but they're perfectly happy to have us distracted and disoriented and and weakened in different ways. So uh, I don't think it's wrong to see points of connectivity between them. I I would really only talk about those two. I think when people add in Iran and other things, then we're really kind of creating categories that make no sense. But I do think there is a tactical alignment right now between Beijing and Moscow that we need to be particularly preoccupied by. We have a little bit of time, and I'd love to take some questions from the audience, um, if there are some, and I'm sure that there must. We have a couple of microphones circulating. Any brave soul? Scott, let's get him a mic, please. I'll I'll project. Um, Here it comes. And just tell us who you are, please. Sure. Uh, Scott Lesensky. I work at uh, INSS, the Israeli think tank, and teach at the University of Maryland. Uh, congratulations. Look forward to reading the report. Uh, diasporas. You know, it's a world not just of migration, but of huge diasporas. Democratic countries have lots of them. I'll just mention one example here. Jewish Americans, very vocal on democracy in Israel. This week, actually, it's kind of a headline. 
Have you thought about uh, diasporas? What about the Chinese, the Russians, big diasporas that seem to be very hesitant or maybe boxed out given um, how their countries treat their diasporas? I'm going to do the classic thing of pivoting from what you asked to a topic that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> no, uh, actually, we didn't spend a lot of time on diasporas, but it is important to, to make the point that one of the essays that's part of this project is about Israel and poses the question of whether we should be thinking about Israel as a solid democracy or a democracy in experiencing some difficulties. Tamara Wittes wrote the paper and argues that we should be thinking about Israel as sort of part of the group of democracies that needs to focus on shared renewal. Uh, that it's not a democracy with which we don't have to be worried about its course and its trajectory. So there is, it, it, Israel is included in this notion of a, a wider renewal of democracy around the world. I ha- we haven't thought much about the Chinese and Russian immigrant question. We should think more about that one. In the back, please. So Chris Walker at the National Endowment for Democracy. It was mentioned uh, at least a couple of times during the discussion that China and Russia don't have shared interests. This is a Uh, an arrangement of convenience and tactical. And then in the second breath, it was something like, but they really would like to see the United States and its democratic allies weakened. I wonder if it might not be more appropriate to say that Russia and China, given the way in which they've aligned in a host of ways that weren't anticipated, say, five or ten years ago, have a shared interest in seeing democracy... um, on its heels, or worse, at this stage, rather than taking the softer approach, which in a way elides, I think, a good deal of what we're seeing in the last few years. So I think John said this in his opening remarks, that one of the the opening theme of the report is that whereas we have been talking about geopolitics and China's surge and Russia's action, et cetera, as struggles for sphere of influence, we actually think we need to be seeing this as a struggle Uh, about the role of democracy in international order. That both in Europe and in Asia and in the global south, that both of those powers are seeking to weaken not just the democracies, but the role of democracy in international order. So very much so. That's the sort of opening sentiment of the report. Now, I, I still think that it's the case that Russia and China have... Uh, fundamentally different interests in different things, and that is an important thing to not lose sight of and to play with, etc. But I, but I agree with that formulation. That's it's a sense of the opening sentiment of of where we come down. Here, please. Thank you, uh, Yuri Lepshin. I'm with the Renew Democracy Initiative, a relatively new organization. Um, but I was wondering if you had a chance to look at some of the internal forces within countries such as Russia and China, and whether those forces are buffeting those countries in more or less authoritarian directions, and whether we might work with those forces or anything of that sort. Yeah, not in this project, but there's sort of cognate work that will look closely at that. I, I, I will say on, on – I know China much better than I know Russia. Other people in the room know Russia better. Five years ago, I think it was reasonable to look at the balance of forces in China and say they were confronting a very critical moment in their own direction, Right real power in the movement in Shanghai in particular to push for intellectual property rights, to push for the rule of law, to push for an open internet as what was going to be necessary for the next wave of innovation, butting it up against Beijing's increasing nervousness about sort of loss of control in the Communist Party, right? And that came to a head in the 19th People's Congress, and we didn't know which way they were going to go. But they rolled chose, right? They set a real clear choice. Um, And so it's not as if those forces have gone away, but so far... China has not lent in the direction of those more open forces, right? It's lent the other way uh, in the last several years. Russia, maybe it's a more contested uh, debate over time. But China is by far and away the greater question here, in my view. Russia is an entirely secondary question to China, in my view, in these debates. So China is a very complicated place. Things can unfold in complicated ways, to be sure. But for now, at least, I think we have to look at a China that has been able to Uh, successfully consolidate its ability to manage those kinds of internal tensions and project outwards with a pretty pretty significant degree of sophistication. Yes, right here, please. Here comes the mic. Right behind you. Thank you. Alice Rivlin, uh, Economic Studies at Brookings. 
You seem ins to me insufficiently worried about the state of our democracy at home. And if the United States doesn't have a democracy that's functioning to make policy and to come to grips with things like climate change and uh, other major threats to the world's well-being, and if we pull out of our alliances, which weren't working all that well anyway, uh, but we pull back from them, um, who's going to be the engine of democracy, if not us? From your lips to God's ears. Um, uh, look, I, I try to respect uh, sort of functional boundaries here, right? So there's, as I said, there are 30 scholars and governance studies here doing extremely important work on the state of our democracy. And one of the things the report does is say, please go look at all of that work. Uh, we asked Bill Galston to be part of this project, so we at least had a kind of a, a connective tissue between that and the work of other kind of foreign policy dimensions. But there's no question that if we don't... Uh, begin to move past this particularly challenged moment in our own democracy, the rest that follows will be vastly harder. Now, I, I don't think it's quite as black and white as you put it, though, because uh, for two reasons. Let's take the alliance question. For all of Donald Trump's rhetoric, it seems to me a very important fact that we have seen is the rallying of the American institutions writ large to defense of the alliance structure. That is a non-trivial fact. Uh, when we have more troops in NATO in Europe now than we did at the Trump, beginning of the Trump administration, when we have a uh, huge degree of congressional support for the alliance structure. You heard Senator Shaheen talk about it. That is, it's not, it doesn't remove the fact that we have a president that doesn't believe in the alliance structure. That's a very important fact. But it is an equally, or not equally, but it's also a very important fact that the, the American institutions have rallied to, to their defense. So I don't think it's as if we are... Um, Sorry, and, and the second reason I say it is because for the United States to be the bulwark of support to democracy and international order, it also has to be the bulwark of international security in international order. They're not quite the same thing, and there's some tension between them. We acknowledge that tension. It's a long-running debate in American foreign policy. If we were rhetorically and through aid and in other ways embracing democracy – but failing to think through and to confront and build the capacity to confront China in security terms, the former project would fail. Uh, so these two things move hand in hand. And I think that we are watching a moment in which, for a whole host of reasons, um, despite the president's stated policy, we are still doing quite a lot to maintain the international security role that we have had, and the kind of elements of that are still present. We can have that debate about how far that's eroded or not. It depends a little bit how long this moment lasts. But so it's not as if uh, we have walked away from the world. We can overstate. This is one place I think we do overstate the extent to which we've walked away from the world. We haven't walked away from the world. Rhetorically, we have a very different debate than we used to about the degree to which we should be out there in the world, but we haven't actually walked away from the world. So there's a lot still there on which to build, which is necessary, in addition to what you said about the restoration of American democracy here. Yes, please. Hi, Amy Hawthorne from the Project on Middle East Democracy. In addition to confronting authoritarian adversaries like Russia and China and shoring up or renewing democracy in existing democracies, what role in your strategy uh, is there for promoting democracy in authoritarian allies? Um, my strategy is all about sort of having Salam Fayyad at Brookings and uh, we build from there. <laughs> um, now, in all seriousness, uh, one of the important outgrowths of this project is a book that Tammy Wittes is doing on that question. I think you know Tammy's work on this. Um, I think she's going to call it RSOBs, just to pick up that old, old debate. Are you, are you asking specifically about the Middle East or are you asking more broadly? Yeah. I would say this, the project of us trying to generate transformation of authoritarians into democracies has not been massively successful in the past couple of decades. We need to be honest about that. At the same time, it strikes me as extremely important not to abandon that project. 
right? So we cite Salam Fayyad uh, in the report, and you'll read shortly uh, an interview that I've done with him on these issues, which I'm going to, if you don't mind that I quote it, I call it a kind of mobilization of spirit, uh, an essential refusal to abandon the project of democratization in the Middle East over the longer term, at the same time recognizing that we're not in a great place to start that uh, debate, given our engagement over the last 20 years, given the state of play, given what's happened since the Arab Spring. Um, so it's certainly a project to be uh, very aware of, but it's not in our in our conclusions. It's not where we start. Where we start is defense of democracy in Europe and Asia. Uh, there are serious challenges to def- democracy in Europe and Asia already. Uh, making sure that we consolidate our position, consolidate the democracies in Europe and Asia, strikes us as sort of uh, an absolutely ne- necessary part of strategy. Whether we can additionally take on the business of uh, helping transform uh, authoritarian states into democracies. By all means, let's have that as part of our ambition, but with a healthy dose of modesty about our success rate to date, uh, and I think a healthy dose of modesty about the time frame in which that has to take place. And one of the themes that we have to develop, I think, is what is the time frame for that, for that conversation. Nils. Thank you. Nils Gilman from the Begrun Institute in Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> most of the conversation so far has been really about foreign policy and assumes an effectiveness of, of policy and policy making as a causal variable. But I just want to ask you to reflect a little bit on possibly other factors than just direct policy and disentangling which of these are most important. So one is policy, democracy promotion, working on our alliance structures and so on. There's a second possibility, though, which is a demonstration effects. And this is what I think we were getting at. If we're not demonstrating a good democracy at home, then what effectiveness can we have abroad? I mean, many people have made the case that the best thing that's happened to China and its authoritarian agenda is what's happening in our democracy at home from a demonstration effect. But there's also a third possibility, at least, that I can imagine, which is a kind of institutional isomorphism, right, which is as China goes into, say, Africa and becomes a leading trading partner, it's not so much that they're directly promoting anti-authoritarian regimes as regimes that want to do business with the Chinese will naturally take on the characteristics of the counterparty that they want to do the majority of their business with. Which of those things we think is most important has really different implications for how we might think about where we want to put our emphasis from a policy perspective. Want to reflect on that? Yeah, although I would say um, it also changes a lot depending on what part of the world you're talking about, what is the character of the state that you're talking about in question, right? So if you're in the weaker parts of the global south, the institutional morphism is going to be a very important part of the trajectory. And it's why we talk, this is a very geeky, social science kind of conversation, but um, the, 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 the degree to which national institutions are incentivized to adapt themselves to the, the, the feeling and texture of the institutions that give them resources, essentially, right? Um, it's one of the reasons we talk quite a lot about the report, about arguing for uh, a number of democracies, ourselves, Japan, uh, others, to join forces in the way we provide infrastructure support, energy support, technology support, et cetera, to these countries. Because right now, if I'm Djibouti, and China's offering me a huge amount of economic and technological aid with no conditions, and the West is offering me a pittance and a bunch of conditions, well, yeah, I'm going to choose China. That's a no-brainer, right? Although I think it's very important to stress that um, – let me, let me back up for one second. I'm very conscious in writing about this in the report, and you are very aware of these. It is not as if we have an unblemished track record on these issues, right? Some of the discussion in this town about China's behavior makes it sound as if the West has been this paragon of democracy and values in our engagement in the global south over the past 50 years. Well, right? We know the realities. The realities are much messier than that. And we may forget this stuff. But at least in the countries in question, sure as hell don't, right? And it links back to this notion of a shared agenda of democratic renewal and being a little bit more modest in our projection. Um, uh, we have to be willing to provide high-quality aid at a high standards, but at scale, if we're going to be able to compete with the Chinese. Uh, because if not, then the attraction will be substantial. That being said, there's a very important variable here. If we, if we dialed this back 30 years and we were having this debate, in large parts of the developing world, these were still low-income countries at a low level of institutional development. That's still is true some places. But the intervening 30 years have seen a huge amount of growth and a huge amount of institutional development in the global south. 
So I think one of the things we're seeing is that China comes into an Ethiopia or a Mexico or et cetera uh, and hopes that they find that kind of at, at in, instinctive adaptation. They're encountering quite a lot more resistance than they might have done 30 years ago. And we, that's a very important asset that we have, that countries who are further developed, who are richer, have more consolidated sovereignty, are more able to push back on us as well as the Chinese. So one of the things we talk about in the report is trying to engender a, a kind of race to the top dynamic. The real risk right now is a race to the bottom. That what we do in response to the Chinese is we sort of revert to old habits of bribery and pressure and these kinds of things versus a, a kind of a, a, a dynamic of trying to generate a race to the top. But these sovereign conditions in large parts of the global south are such that there could be a race to the top dynamic. So in, in the global south, I think that's the right response. In other parts of the world, the model question is important. Though I would still add that it's not only us exhibiting the model for all its weaknesses, et cetera, it's also our willingness in hard security terms to stand with people that matters a great deal as well. I, I would like to mention we have time for about one more question. Um, okay. The gentleman in the tweed suit has been waiting the longest. You, sir? Oh, no? Okay, right here then. I think it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Marvin Kalp here at Brookings. Uh, the word democracy has been used perhaps more than any other. And I think there's an assumption that we all understand that word in the same way. But democracy is used, as you well know, in so many different ways all over the world. So we speak about democratic values, and we want to move those, I hope, aggressively around the world. What are we specifically pushing? Let's take the next question, too. Wait, also, uh, Bruce Stokes, uh, did, to what extent, Bruce, did, you, did, to what extent did, did you wrestle with the question of the changing nature of democracy, in, especially in Europe and the United States, in terms of the public's growing uh, affection for or interest in direct democracy as opposed to representative democracy, in part as a, as a reflection of the failure of representative democracy to deliver, but also the technological capability that, that now exists for people to believe that they should be able to vote on all major national issues um, and the potential for manipulation of that as a result and also just the complication it creates in this geopolitical order. So two related questions, both really about what do we speak of when we speak of democracy? And thank God I had a co-author who knows these issues better than I do. <laughs> Tori is someplace, and where is Tori Tausig? Oh, she's run out. But anyway, Tori Tausig, who is my co-author, spent the, did more of the writing in this report. So in the report itself, there's a, a thorough discussion of what do we mean when we talk about this? What are the critical elements of democracy that, that we're talking about? And then, yeah, there's both an input paper on direct democracy. And we grapple with it in terms also of the, uh, the uh, well, two different issues. One, the emergence of illiberal democracies in Europe. So we have a whole cognate report that Alina Polyakova led on the emergence of illiberal democracy in Eastern Europe. The interplay between that and direct democracy, uh, which is quite important. Uh, and one of the recommendations is that for the consolidated, for the advanced democracies, the consolidated democracies, we have to, it goes back to the modeling question, we have to model what high-quality direct democracy looks like. So that when uh, Amrador Obrador in, Lopez Obrador in Mexico does a, quote, referendum in five counties, all of whom voted for him and not in the others through an unconstitutional process and uses that as a basis, right? That we can say with confidence that does not constitute a valid exercise of direct democracy, right? So this is going to be a theme that we will see and, and the consolidated democracies have to model uh, what, uh, what direct democracy really looks like. So now we truly are out of time and because I'm slightly scared of General Allen, I'm not going to run over. Um, <laughs> Let me Where just conclude all? by um, congratulating Bruce and all of the scholars who worked on this spectacular collection of reports. It's really a, a monumental and very impressive body of work, um, and you should be commended for it. Um, and uh, please join me in thanking Bruce for this great conversation as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.